And we do a lot of stuff. I'm like, please, 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 please. I don't have that much time. Can we take like the dopest selfie of all time? Yeah. Where y'all at? Where y'all at? Oh, yeah. Where y'all at? Come on now. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 Sometimes. Sometimes. Especially when you've had that experience of. Sometimes it's awkward and strange and lonely when you don't feel him right there. What do you do when you don't feel his presence right there? When theology is not enough, knowing that he's omnipresent is not enough. When you don't feel his presence right there. Why sometimes do we not feel the presence of the Lord? <laughs> sometimes it's just blatant sin, right? Sometimes it's just we just we just go in a direction that we know is opposite or anti the will of God. Sometimes it's just blatant. And then there's the infamous and ambiguous dry season, right? Like what is that? That dry season that even the the, the most Scholarly scholars can't really explain, and, and all of them just go to something subjective and say, well, this is my experience, or this is my why, because that dry season is, really can't be explained. I want to say something quickly about a dry season, though, that the, one of the things about being away from God and not feeling the presence of God, one of the, the, the things about uh, not being with him, it's as simple as we desire feeling good more than we desire being with our God. Wow. Sometimes it's just that simple. See, sin is separation from God. Devotion is attachment to God. And sometimes it's that simple. But as it relates to dry season, I, I just want to quickly, I'm not going to stay here long, but as it relates to, to dry seasons, I want to just highlight Psalm 13. And, and David um, appears to be in a dry season. There's no evidence of blatant sin. There's no evidence of, of him avoiding the call of God. It, it, it just seems like he was with God, and, and it, at least in his experience, God wasn't with him. And Psalm 13.1 says, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And he, he waxes on about how horrible and difficult the situation is. But then the chapter ends in this way. In his dry season, he cried out and said, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You want to know if you're in a dry season or you have committed blatant sin or avoided the call of God? If in your dry season, it ends with worship to God, even in that moment when you don't feel it, if you're crying out and remembering all that he's done for you, then it's just the dry season. But if you're not calling out to God, Remember, sin is separation from God, and devotion is attachment to God. Oh, so y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. Okay, I got to come on your block. Huh? I got to get on your block. All right, all right. All right, boyfriends and girlfriends in the building. If your boyfriend is having a dry season, <laughs> If he is really your boyfriend, <laughs> his affection is still towards you. He still remembers you. He's not so, oh, come on now. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. I'm by myself. I'm by myself. But somehow when it gets to God, we feel like, well, relationship in the dry season, that means I get to trip away. But oh. that's not okay in my boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. Somebody understand? But often, what us 
ushers us and where I'm going to spend my time today. Often what ushers us into these seasons where we don't feel the presence of God is a fancy word called prerogative. It's that thing where with our freedom we use it to choose others. We use it to choose everything but the call of God in our life. And, and sometimes if we avoid, we avoid the call completely. And sometimes we do what God wants, but we don't do it when God wants. Or sometimes we do what God wants, but we don't do it how God wants. Or sometimes we do what God wants, but we don't want to do it where God wants us to do. And in our story today, we're going to be in Jonah 1. If you have a Bible, if you have an iPad, if you have a, 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 a smartphone, if you turn your Bible apps on, please turn those things on. I want to see those apps come on. I want to see the glow, the Shekinah glory of God on your face. Come on. Turn them on. Turn them on. All right. All right. Let's walk together through the book of Jonah. Today we're talking about prerogative or avoiding the call, the avoiding the dream, the responsibility, that thing we know is from God, that, that we know God wants for us to do. Question. Have you been running from the call of God? Has God been calling and you've been sending him to voicemail? You know, as God called and, and you saw him on your phone and you press the red button. Have you been ignoring the whisper, silencing the ringer? Today, he's calling you to step into your destiny because devotion is attachment to God. Maybe God feels far away because you sent him to your voicemail. For clarity, voicemails are those events that occur when one doesn't answer the call. My mom loves to leave me voicemails. <laughs> I, I, my, my phone will ring, and, and, and I'm a country boy. I, I, I was born out here from my family from Alabama, so I'm a country boy. And, and my phone will ring, and, and then I'll see it, and, and, and I'll ask her, and I'll say, hey, Ma. I don't say Ma. Our mother. I say mom, all right? Hey, mom! And then she'll go, hey, hey, hey I, I, I wasn't calling you. I was trying to leave you a voicemail. <laughs> all right, mom. And I hang up, right? <laughs> but when I go back and check my voicemail, she says things like, son, don't grow weary and go do it. Or she'll say something like, son, you've had a calling in your life since you were nine or ten years old. Or she, she read something in scripture and, and she left me the verse that inspired her. My mom leaves me voicemails in order to reroute me back to God because when God leaves those voicemails to reroute him back to the call, I want to see that here in the story of Jonah. You guys ready? Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. Oh, come on, man. I hear like the faculty. Y'all ready? What's going on? Yeah. The word of the Lord came to John, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You guys see that? He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah had divine authority to go to Nineveh from, the, from God. God spoke to him and said, go to Nineveh. He heard the call, but when God called, he pressed the red one. The reason God sent Jonah to preach to Nineveh was to judge that city. And Jonah fled to Joppa. Jonah had a calling on his life, a calling to be a prophet. And he didn't stop being a prophet. 
He didn't, he just didn't want to prophesy where God called him to prophesy. See, sometimes you feel like because I still do Christian things, I'm still in the will of God. But doing the will of God is not just doing Christian things, it's doing the what, the when, the how, and the where. See, Nineveh was a city that good Christian folks wouldn't want to go to. Nineveh is the place where they would slay people. Slaying is a practice where you would skin someone, but you would try to keep the skin intact as you did it. You were creating like skin bodysuits. Nineveh is the city. Rome made it popular, but Nineveh is the actual city who created or started or began crucifixion. Nineveh was known for its war crimes. Nineveh was known for, for, for keeping um, prisoners of war. Nineveh was a terror to the city. Uh, they, were from the, uh, they were a city in Assyria, and they were known for all these atrocities, and a good God-fearing person would not want to go there. So he kept doing the will of God. He just didn't want to do it where God wanted him to do it. Oh, that should be preaching to somebody. <laughs> That should be talking to somebody. He paid the fare. The word here really means he commandeered the boat. In other words, Jonah paid or rented out the boat, the time it would take to get from Joppa to Tarshish, he rented out all the mariners. In other words, sin is going to cost you. If he would have just responded to the call of God in the beginning, it would have been his burden would have been light, but now his burdens are heavy because he chose to go outside the will of God. The devil, listen to me, y'all, Y'all believe in the devil right here, right? The devil's real, right? You don't know? All right. Devil's real. The devil will always have a boat to Tarshish ready for you. Wow. The evil one will always have easy passage or access for you to avoid the call of God on your life. And that always leads you away from the presence of I heard y'all say amen. That's what I heard. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> God often says go, and we often say no. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God would give you a thought to us that we may not perish. All right. Now, me and my man Jonah, we're on the same page now. <laughs> my man Jonah, it's a storm going on. Everybody's out working hard, trying to deal with this storm. And my man Jonah is at the bottom of the ship, snoring. <laughs> it reminds me of a trip that my wife and I uh, and my son took to Vegas. He's a, a young basketball player. He's taller than me. Uh, and we're out there, and we have this room. And there's two beds in the room, but there's also like a living room area. And but 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 so my, my son is in the other on the other side of the room, and me and my wife on the other side. And and in the morning, I wake up and I see my son in the chair. With, you know, his neck is all to the side. Later, old Street tells me that Ryan comes to her and goes, "Mom, how are you doing?" Because when I'm asleep, I'm asleep. So I understand Jonah. Jonah's knocked out. Well, why, why is Jonah knocked out? Because sin will wear you out. 
disobedience is draining. And while everyone is dealing with Jonah's sin, Jonah is oblivious. The mariners were, were, were trying to get the water out the boat and trying to steer the boat. And Jonah is at the bottom soaring. Disobedience is not an individual sport. See, often others pay when we fail to respond to the call. Sin is rarely individual. You, 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 you deciding not to respond to the call of God, not only does it put you in a place where you're away from the presence of God, but it brings a storm that hits all of those around you. Sin is not an individual sport. And remember verse 1? God called to Jonah, go to Nineveh. He sent him a voice now. Here, Jonah's in the process of avoiding the call, and God sends a storm. Is it God hurled the storm at him? See, sometimes the storm is just a new voicemail because we didn't respond to the initial phone call. See, sometimes what you're going through is just God trying to reroute you back to what he had intended for you in the first place. But Jonah was snoring. See, while you sleep undisturbed, your sleep disturbs others. Not too much? Too much for college folks? <laughs> Verse 7. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots. Lots were stones that were painted different colors on each side. And Proverbs says that, that God is in the lots. In other words, God created the results. So, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So I'm glad I'm out of university so you guys understand all this technical stuff. This, this, this part of the passage is, is built on what's called a chiastic structure. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like a poem where the beginning and the end is parallel, and then the two lines are parallel that are I'm right next to it, and then it leads into an arrow. And this, this chiastic structure ends in chapter or verse 9. And verse 9 says this. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. See, the problem here. is that Jonah had an identity issue. Sometimes we're far from God because we have an identity issue. Sometimes we don't get that whose we are dictates who we are. See, Jonah, he knew whose he was. He knew his identity, but he wasn't functioning according to the call of God on his life. Jonah was a preacher who wouldn't preach. Jonah was, but he wouldn't. See, although he was, he was living like he wasn't. Even though we are, we often live like we are not. And then we get in these places and we say, God, where are you? He's 
there the whole time. Right. He's calling you. Not just to be in him, but to live for him. And he loves you too much to allow you to go off and be anything other than what he has called you to be. Verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you? That the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rolled hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us, in, lay not on us innocent blood for you, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Isn't it crazy when non-believers have better theology than the believers? I think for followers of Jesus Christ, our dry season. We get the blatant sin, right? Nobody understands the dry season. I think this is what really gets us. We want to be Christian. We just want to do it our way. We, we, we want to be called. We just want to go where we want to go. See, sometimes when you live on mission, you won't like where you end up. See, sometimes when you live on mission, you won't like what you have to do. And we often, in the name of freedom, avoid the call of God, the nudge of God, the pointing, the assignment of God. And then we ask the question, God, where are you? God is there. God loves folks. God loves folks that you don't like. That's right. That's right. That person that you can't stand. God loves that person. Each time you don't respond to God's calling on your life, you learn to habitually. Walk away from the presence of the Lord. Wow. And God, and all the trials and difficulties in your life, not all of them, but a lot of them are God hurling storms and situations that you, that you might come back. He's calling and leaving you. Voicemail. Let me end. Verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Out of tribulation and difficulty, Jonah's ministry was fulfilled. See, Jonah avoided the call, and God sent the storm, and Jonah eventually was swallowed by a great fish. And in those three days, that is what actually launched his ministry doesn't sound familiar. See, out of tribulation and difficulty, Jesus' ministry was fulfilled. In our most desperate hours, God is fulfilling our destiny. See, God leaves you. God loves you too much to leave you where you are. But you, did you notice God's reaction to Jonah? God calls Jonah, and Jonah presses the red button. God sends the storm, and Jonah presses the red button. From the belly of the great fish, Jonah calls God, and God says, Hello? Hey, Jonah. <laughs> See, we often avoid God's call, even though God always answers ours. 
If you are in a dry season, if you are in your three days, if you are in the belly of the great fish, I urge you, I, 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 I beg of you, call out to a God who always presses the green button. Maybe God feels far away because you sent him to voicemail. Maybe you, you feel far from God because you're not living the way that God has called you to live. I'm not saying you're out doing wild and crazy things, but you know when, when you saw that person at 7-Eleven that God was urging you to give them a dollar, but instead of giving them a dollar, you say, oh, they're probably going to spend it on some drugs or things. See, those little failures to respond when you know God is calling, they take you closer and closer to Tarshish, away from the presence of God. Let me end with this thought. God didn't need Jonah. Jonah calls God. I mean, God calls Jonah. And Jonah says, in the voice now. God starts stalking Jonah, throwing swords at him. Jonah says in the voicemail, let me tell you something. I call you, and you don't answer the phone, you got one more phone call, and we done. <laughs> See, but when God has something for you, God has something for you. He's not going to call someone else to do and to get the blessing that he has for you. God doesn't just use people to complete tasks. He could have called anybody. God uses tasks to complete people. You feel alone. You feel desperately away from God. Because you're not functioning the way God wants you to function. Cry out to God. He always presses the green button. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Oh, can you stand? Oh, can you stand? Can I send you out the same way that, that, that God sent Jonah? Hope International, arise and go. Amen? Amen.